so clearly the movie of the week in terms of uh, coverage, comment, posters, stuff on the news, stuff in your newspaper, is all about the Iron Lady. Take it away. So the story is, it's a biopic of Margaret Thatcher, or is it? And that seems to be the kind of the key issue. Already, um, Meryl Streep has said it's not a biopic. Actually, it's something else. And it, it has managed in quite an interesting way to affront almost everybody from every single sort of side of the political spectrum. That could be seen as a good thing. I know, exactly. I mean, that in a way is a movie that manages to annoy everybody in some way is actually quite an achievement. But essentially, the story is it's Margaret Thatcher's life as seen in flashback from the point of view of the now elderly Lady Thatcher, who, in the version of her that we see in the movie, is suffering from, uh, I think, senile dementia to some extent. She is having visions of Dennis, who she sees not so much as a ghost, but still as a still as a very much a living presence. And whilst attempting to clear out her closets of his belongings, she flashes back to her career, and we see her as the young Margaret Thatcher, as a young becoming an MP, and then of course Margaret Thatcher becoming the Prime Minister. We have two clips. This is, should we play the early clip first of, of Margaret Thatcher b before it's Marilyn, before she is voiced? Here's an early clip. Teachers cannot teach when there is no heating, no lighting in their classrooms. And I ask the right honourable gentleman, whose fault is that? No, 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 no. Methinks the right honourable lady doth screech too much. <laughs> And, and if she wants us to take her seriously, she must learn to calm down. If the right honourable gentleman could perhaps attend more closely to what I am saying, rather than how I am saying it, he may receive a valuable education in spite of himself. OK, so clip of her doing the, uh, you know, the screechy voice from early on. Then, of course, what happens is, famously, as we all know, the story that she's brought in, she's told, you can't continue to talk like that. In fact, actually, if you've seen the trailer for the film, the trailer basically is this conversation in which they say, we have to do something about the way in which you talk, we have to do something about your voice, we have to do something about your appearance. And that's when you then see the reverse of Meryl Streep saying, the pearl... I can't do it, saying the pearls are non-negotiable. Really, so one of the few voices you that I can't, can't do. No, do. it's amazing, isn't it? And then she becomes Margaret Thatcher. So here's a, a clip from later on. How would you have dealt with this if you'd been Prime Minister? Well, the, the bombings, Mummy, today. We were just talking about them. No, yes, we have always lived alongside evil, but it has never been so patient, so avid for carnage, so eager to carry innocence along with it into oblivion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Western civilization must root out this evil wherever it hides, or she risks defeat at the hands of global terror in a nuclear age unimaginable. Mm. Yeah. Prime Minister made a very good statement, I thought. Yes, yeah. clever man. Quite a smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a smoothie. <laughs> I think what's interesting about that, just listening to it, as people will have heard the audio as opposed to seeing yeah. the physical image that Meryl Streep does, is that she's that doesn't sound like an impression in the way that Steve Nallen did the best that it, when he because he did the voices on Spitting image. image, and he always had it absolutely 100 percent. Well, I here's the thing for me, and this is actually what you and I ended up having a row about even before you'd seen the film. The question is, if you're going to do a biopic about Margaret Thatcher, do you are you duty bound to make it political? Or is it possible to essentially just skim over the surface of the politics and see all that as a background to a personal story? Now, obviously, there is a great history, a great history of making documentaries about political figures, and the key to it is what you do is you say, okay, well, the politics is secondary to the person. I mean, if you look, for example, at um, you know, you think of Oliver Stone doing Nixon, and I mean, obviously, Nixon, you know, a figure of uh, great controversy who was you know thrown out, well, left the White House, but left the White House in disgrace. And yet, when Oliver Stone did his biopic with Sir Anthony Hopkins, who looks nothing like Nixon, but actually I thought I had a very great presence of Nixon. It was all about, okay, well, you know, he's the th here are the things that he did that were good. Yes, he was completely corrupt, and yes, all the Watergate stuff happened, but you know what? Actually, we can find the roots of it in his relationship with his mother. When you look at the forthcoming uh, J. Edgar Hoover with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, it's, okay, well, yes, we know what J. Edgar Hoover did, but on the other hand, let's trace it back to, again, to, to, to his childhood and to his relationship with his mother, played by Judi Dench. If you look, I mean, even if you look back at... Um, 
you know, springtime for Hitler in uh, in the producers when there's that whole thing. But yes, but you know, what nobody ever says about him is that he was a brilliant painter and he loved to dance. I mean, there is that there is a tradition of you take a political figure and you take the politics out and you make it into a personal movie. And just at the moment in cinemas, there's the lady, which is the film about uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, and at the centre of that. I mean, it's funny, even when you read the press notes about it, they'll say, well, it's, it, there is a political story there, but most importantly, it is first and foremost a love story. It is first and foremost a story about a marriage that is broken apart by somebody's political convictions, and it begins with uh, the character of her partner discovering that he's terminally ill, and the whole film, therefore, is about the sacrifice that's made on a personal level. And that is the standard way of doing it, and the, the re there's a very good reason for that, which is you don't want to alienate the whole half of the audience that isn't on the same political wavelength of you, as you, because as we know, there is a huge spectrum of political uh, opinion. And if you can't have a movie that's just going to appeal to Tories or just going to appeal to Labour voters or just going to appeal to Lib Dems or just going to appeal to those who support the coalition. SNP. Well, SNP, well, whatever it is, exactly. Everybody, what you have to do is you have to say it is a universal tale. It is about very human emotions. And generally, you have to say at the centre of it is a, there's a love story. And that is a very standard way of doing biopics of political characters and certainly what's happened here the script by Abby Morgan who also wrote Shame uh, directed by Phil Lloyd who is most famous for making Mama Mia which turned out to be the most successful movie in the UK massive hit everyone loves it for different reasons it has to be said but everyone does love it and at the centre of it all is Meryl Streep doing a performance that you can either say is an impression or you can say is a, I mean I have to say I did think that a lot of it I was impressed by it on the level of it being an impression. When we were talking about this before, I was saying, who was the, who was, is it Janet Brown? She was one of the, she was one of the people who standardly used to do Margaret yeah. Thatcher as the son of, you know, uh, on, on those impression shows. And you think, well, it's a really, really good version of what was being done by that. You know, she's got the mannerism right, she's got the look right, she's got the hair right, but most importantly, she's got the voice right. So all that, so at the center of it is quite clearly a very good impression by Meryl Streep. That is what that that is what it is. The question is whether or not there's any more than that. Also, the whole framing device of starting with her in her dotage as a I'm gonna I'll stop so we can have a break for travel because obviously we have a lot more to talk about this. But the whole thing about having her in a dotage as essentially a fragile person who is you know who is now mourning the loss of her of, of her husband does that whole thing about humanizing it from the beginning look it's, it's okay the power's gone you know this is this is a person this is a human being this is somebody for whom we immediately feel sympathy and compassion because you know you see her very early on walking down the shops to buy a pint of milk and that's you know that's an ordinary human thing. so it's it's doing all those things it's saying it's a person and then the prime focus of the story at least when i saw it i thought the prime focus of the story was that she's a gutsy woman who stands up against all the male toffs in the establishment and demonstrates that she's tougher than them that she's steelier than them now interestingly enough in uh, in an interview in the paper today um please would look, really good, it would be says the story is about I just chance it from no, 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 but, all but, the papers okay, available fine thank you it says the story is about loss it's a sort of king lear story about a mighty leader who rises to power against all the odds who holds the line when others are losing their faith who becomes a global superstar and then either through her own hubris as they see it the treachery of everyone else around them crashes to an ignominious end but really it's a film about identity and old age and facing oblivion and can this lady let go of the one thing which is uh, now imagined but sustains her in a sense of herself so what she's saying is it's not about politics right it's about age it's about the fact that we all become old we all become fragile we all become in firm that no matter how you know how and if Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy isn't about spying then this doesn't have to be about you know the funny thing about it is gotcha. in a way let's say that this is a movie about spying because my problem <laughs> with it and it's it, it, and 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 uh, this is the point at which you and I disagree I don't think you can make a movie about Margaret Thatcher without making it about the politics of the period if you just if you literally use the politics as window dressing as just you know background and sofa and all the rest of it it kind of makes the story not make any sense because regardless of what you think about Thatcher's policies and you know opinions are still very very heat no they are they you know are. very very no, heated about it. in fact I've, I've read several reviews of this of the film in which people have said cards on the table at the beginning I have very strong feelings about uh, you know about Margaret Thatcher that you know as the prime minister and I mean you know I mean obviously I was in Manchester in the 1980s and I you know you know very well what my political affiliations are the problem is you former Trotskyist, yeah, yeah, Maoist, fine. but Stalinist. you can't just simply say, okay, that stuff is nothing other than window dressing to the story of a character going through their own personal life because it, it just it makes you think. Well, I'm sorry, that's not the story. Having the miners' strike is something which there's the miners' strike, then it's over. Having sink the bell grind, sink the bell grind, then it's over. Having 
all that stuff as simply some kind of clothing, some kind of costuming, some kind of ca character affirmation stuff is for me not enough. Now, your disagreement is that you think it's perfectly possible to do that. No, no, no. The basis of our disagreement before I'd seen the film right, was. was entirely based on the fact that you were, I, at the time, though you've slightly nuanced your... Uh, oh, go on, uh, how are, uh, no, your let view. me un-nuance it. I don't want uh, to do that. Is, is, is you were reviewing Margaret Thatcher, the woman, and her policies as opposed to the film. For example, one of the things that you took exception to... Is the Francis of Assisi speech. Is the Francis of Assisi speech, which Margaret Thatcher gave on the steps of Downing Street, famously, and or infamously, depending infamously, on which I you want to do it, yeah. uh, where there is discord, let us bring harmony, yeah. uh, and so on, which when it actually happened, there were loads of demonstrations, lots of people shouting, and she had to use her shrieky voice to actually uh, get herself heard. In the film, it's delivered to complete silence, and she's surrounded by police. And, so yeah. on. and you really took exception to that because you said it didn't happen like well, that, no, what I said, so, which I said, it it's a film, Mark, well, what, what to you which Professor Linda Ruth Williams said, in Made in Dagenham, there's lots of stuff that happens in there that didn't actually happen like that. But because it's a film and you go with the central thrust of the story, that's OK. But the interesting thing is that the, what the story of what actually happened is really interesting and is really important and can't just be, you know, trivialised away into the background. It, you, I just don't think you can do that. Plus, it kind of becomes so episodic. I mean, literally, there are entire supporting characters who are recognisable only through their suit and their haircut. You'll see a shot of the cabinet and you'll go, oh, there's Heseltine. There's, you know, people will literally crop up. They'll maybe get one line. and then Anthony Head, I think, is Jeffrey Howe. Jeffrey is, fan Howe. is fantastic. Yes. I, mean, I, think he, I think he's really good. Richard E. Grant, hardly worth it, really, for, for, his, for his Michael Heseltine. No, well, he turns up, he's, he's got the Heseltine hair, right? I, I mean, don't think the politics is as superfluous as you're making out. Let me put okay. a, let me give a, 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 another view, which okay. comes from your beloved sure. Guardian. Michael White, a uh, great respected political commentator, was at the same screening that, that I went to. Yeah. His, his review of it uh, basically said he thinks it's, a, it's essentially a feminist film. In well, that, yeah, in that it, it, it's, its central story is how a woman came to run this country for the first time since Elizabeth I. And that is the major thing that it's about. You can say what you like about the politics and the Belgrano and the strikes and so on, but that is essentially what it is. And I thought that's, uh, that kind of makes sense. The question it? of whether or not you can, you can reassess Margaret Thatcher as a feminist icon, as you know, is an ongoing one, and there are arguments on both sides of the fence, and I'm not going to have those arguments. because Yes, there, that is an ongoing... Can you just say, obviously, what she did was open the gates of power. She demonstrated that a woman can do a job in exactly the same way as actually can be tougher than men in that... So, yes, that is obviously politically important. But what's also politically important is everything else that was happening around that, the understanding of class. I mean, the creation of, the, you know, the, the society... And the capitalism, the consumer society that we that we now have, it, if Oliver Stone had done it, I mean, in fact, it, Oliver Stone did do it with Nixon. What Oliver Stone did with Nixon was when he was when he was doing that kind of uh, personalization thing, it, and it, obviously Oliver Stone is very much politically opposed to a lot of what Nixon stood for. But he found in the politics what he thought okay. to be interesting about it. It's I think it's perfectly possible to find in the politics of a very interesting story. If you want to say, okay, it's an interesting story about a woman finding her own place and therefore being a feminist like then fine. But the, the film doesn't even really do that. I mean, as the director says, in her opinion, it's a, it's a story about ageing. And actually, I, I, I'm not sure what's gained by having the fragile character now looking back on her life and, and in, in putting it all in. The, I don't know what that framing device does other than essentially soften the character at the beginning and I don't think you need to do that I'd have been much more I mean you look for example at the lady right the lady is political in as much as it's a story of Aung San Suu Kyi and that story is still now unfolding and you talk about an iron lady I mean there you know there is the character sure. that is the iron lady that story is relevant right now it's front page news but it is possible to talk about the politics and the personal at the same time and if you strip the politics away to nothing other than you know hair and makeup you end up watching the film going but that's I mean, I, I know what you're saying is my problem was saying that's not how it happened. It's more complicated than that. It's like saying there is a story there that you have to tell. And if you simply swerve it, the film ultimately feels like a piece of confetti. It feels as empty as the Buffon haircut. You feel like, where's the meat?